Hi there, this is Scott Bradfield. It's Novel Writing for City Lit. And this week I thought we would try to talk about time as things are observed in the story or a novel. And I picked one scene, carrying on from really the, our last lecture, about uh, point of view and seeing things as they happen. And looking at how the eye is there and the senses are there for our point of view characters in order to help measure time. We, we see things happening in time through the senses. This, this helps a good writer avoid telling us all that information that we've been talking about that will drown your stories and which will kill your, your whole narrative if you just keep pouring in information. So I want to look and talk about that for this week and next week as well and, and finish off with more. Again, he's just the sort of writer that you can go to and find all the basic techniques operating almost all of the time. And some writers, it's clear of these techniques. Some writers, it's not so clear. And more is crystal clear. Look at page 86. And this is when Bem has been picked up by the, quote, major, who he thinks is part of the, the, the security forces. And he comes to a realization in a scene of about two pages, which is all coming to us through our point of view, all through Bem. And it doesn't come through him thinking or the author telling us what's going on. It all comes through sentence by sentence in what Bem sees and what happens around him. It's very Hitchcock, very Hitchcockian. As I mentioned, Moore wrote well for Hitchcock, and, and Hitchcock admired Moore's work, and you can see why. Page 86, and this is as they come to the security check. Their speed was now barely 10 kilometers an hour ahead. The colonel's truck came to a full stop, about 30 yards from the last vehicle in the queue. The Volvo also stopped. The major got out and went ahead to confer. The station wagon, the third vehicle in their convoy, parked behind them. Its driver, the gray-haired man in the security policeman's raincoat, got out and came up to them. This is page 86, by the way. And again, we're just seeing things happen as Bem sees them. Vehicle check, he asked the Volvo driver. More than that, I think, the driver said. At that point, the major turned and walked back to them. He seemed agitated. He went up to the driver of the station wagon and whispered something. The driver at once took off his security policeman's raincoat and rolled it up. Under the raincoat, he was wearing a red cardigan darned at the elbows. As he returned to his vehicle, he glanced in at the back seat of the Volvo furtively, as though curious to see what the ecclesiastical prisoner looked like. Their eyes met, and the man moved on, hurried on. Again, Bem sees this. We're not having a writer tell us why this person is suddenly nervous about wearing this security uh, officer's outfit. We just see him do things. We see him take the coat off and roll it up. The queue of vehicles began to move up. The major, seeing this, got back into the Volvo. Well, the driver said. It's all right. Go ahead, the major said. He took off his straw hat and swiped his sleeve along the inside sweatband. He then turned and held out his hand. Give me your idea, eminent. ID, eminence. He hesitated, then reached in his jacket and took out his identity card. The major looked at it, at the photograph, his name, Stephen Bem, the details of his height, weight, hair color, date, and place of birth. So your card's nothing special, he said, and you have an ordinary name very common. God gave me a common name to remind me that I am nothing special, he said. The major handed back the card. Are they checking ID cards then, the driver asked. No, I think it's just a vehicle check, the major said. Even Bem, our central point of view, we're not getting his interior reactions or him being high, you know, high-toned or thinking to himself, oh, this man does not re recognize how good a man I am. He simply says what he has to say. We don't get mired in his, his subjectivity. We just listen to him talk. And that's his strength. And he speaks his strength, and that's how we know him. No, I think it's just a vehicle check, the major said. The queue of cars inched forward. As it did, the major touched the driver on the shoulder. Move up one, he said. We'll go first. And there's your clock ticking. Everywhere more can make that clock tick, he does. The cars moving up into the queue, the various drivers coming out to confer, bits of dialogue as they're waiting. Nothing is told to us 
and nothing's explained to us about what's happening. We're just seeing things happen as Bim sees them. And here's another, and this is sort of the realization moment for Bim, and when he decides to act, all comes out of what he sees. The driver obediently eased the Volvo out of the queue, moving it up in front of the colonel's truck, settling into the space directly ahead. The occupants of the Volvo were now tense and silent. To his surprise, he saw Prisbeck sitting in front of him, making a hurried sign of the cross, and bow his head in prayer. Of course. Why not? The patriotic clergy, no doubt, thought of themselves as God's servants and would ask God's help. But in that instant, into his mind, came the face of the driver of the station wagon, the one who, minutes ago, removed his SP raincoat, revealing that he wore a red cardigan underneath. He knew that he had seen that man before, and now he knew where. He was the man who walked up the aisle of the church in Rakini this afternoon, the one I thought was the priest, the one who went into the sacristy. As he thinks these things, they're almost like his voice speaking, his thoughts are very clear, and the lines of dialogue just drop in as the clock ticks, as he sees these things and as he realizes them. Prisbeck, finishing his prayer, made the sign of the cross once more. Prisbeck was not a member of the patriotic clergy. He was the opposite. He prayed now because he was afraid of being discovered by the soldiers. They were all afraid. They were imposters. The security general, the security major, all of them. And now Bim, by simply watching things, and as we watch things with him, comes to a realization, and things are learned by him as we learn them. And that's, that is perfect time narrative writing. It's the sort of thing again, that Hitchcock would admire and more, that Moore admires in good film writers. And the good film writers and good narrative writers all pay attention to. Any way you can get that clock to tick, and you can watch things happen, and you can see them, hear them, smell them, taste them as they occur, then having your thoughts laid out in time to the beat of these exterior events is the basic, and it's not a hard thing to do, the basic elements of, right, of good narrative writing. Killing that telling voice, killing the expository voice that will say to you, which would say in a, a bad writer, when they reach the, the checkpoint, Bem realized that all these people were the same people he'd seen somewhere else, and it must have been them who had planned this all along, so maybe they were imposters, he realized, and you just have this really boring writer just tell us everything that happened, rather than watch it happen. Okay, so that's for this week. Next week, we're going to we'll finish up with the more, and uh, I want to talk a little bit more about what some people call backstory, and what we know about Bem, and how we learn about Bem as, as, as in terms of his past and of the man who lived before the book starts. And we'll see how little we know of it and how much we learn about him in the course of the book. Okay, we'll see you all next week, and uh, take care. Bye.